Hello and welcome to Beauty at Work. We are in between seasons, so please enjoy this clip from one of our earlier episodes. Philosophers have been trying to define beauty for centuries. I'm not sure anyone's actually succeeded, but we can identify a few essential aspects of it in particular domains. In this clip, astrophysicist and author Dr. Mario Livio explains how these aspects of beauty are especially important in physics. Here's what he had to say. To define beauty is, is a, an almost impossible task. Uh, there probably are as many definitions as the number of people you're going to ask to define it. Um, what I tried to do in, in that book, and that in itself was hard enough, was to define, well, to try to narrow down a little bit when does a physicist talk about a certain theory in physics specifically as being a beautiful theory? So it was not a definition of beauty. It was a definition of beautiful theories in physics. Um, and even that uh, turned out to be very difficult because if you, again, look at many scientists even who talked about beauty in physics, they use many, many words, words like harmony and balance and uh, all kinds of words like that. And I tried to somehow focus on the things which I thought were absolutely essential in a way. Um, and I ended up with three concepts, as you mentioned. I mean, one was symmetry. And symmetry I put in because... Uh, you know, most of the fundamental laws of physics, they have a symmetry associated with them. In fact, all the laws that we call conservation laws, like, you know, people heard about conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, and so on. All of those conservation laws stem from certain symmetries. For example, conservation of momentum stems from the fact that the laws of physics are symmetrical under translation, which means they don't change from place to place. We see the same laws that we have here on Earth apply in a galaxy that is a billion light years away. The same laws of physics apply. Uh, conservation of energy comes from the fact that the laws are symmetric with respect to time. The laws appear not to change with time, and so on. So, so symmetry is really uh, if you like, almost the source from which laws of physics uh, stem. So uh, that was uh, clearly a necessary ingredient. Uh, the second uh, concept that I introduced was simplicity, uh, which I meant in the sense of reductionism, namely that you want theories in physics with the minimum number of variables or equations to describe as many as possible phenomena. For example, we, all, every physicist will tell you that Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism is fantastically beautiful because with just four mathematical equations, four mathematical equations, he could explain all the classical electromagnetic phenomena. This Think about this, you know, there is so much in electromagnetism, all explainable with, with four mathematics, uh, four uh, equations. That is considered absolutely beautiful. Um, things like Einstein's theory of general relativity is thought by some to be the most beautiful theory of all. Um, it's, you know, it's, first of all, it has lots of symmetries built inside it, but, but also you know, with this one theory, you explain everything that's related to gravitational force, uh, you know, and so on, whether it is, uh, I don't know, tides on the, in the ocean, or it is uh, the planets moving around the sun, or how the universe as a whole behaves and all that. Um, so, so all of that is there. So that was the concept of simplicity. And finally, there is the concept that probably least number of people know what that is, which I call the generalized Copernican principle. Uh, and what do I mean by that? 
starting from Copernicus, Copernicus taught us uh, that we or the Earth are nothing special. Uh, we're just another planet orbiting an ordinary star and so on. Since then, we have gone through four more, if you like, Copernican revolutions. Um, astronomer Harlow Shapley showed that in our own Milky Way galaxy, the solar system is not at the center, it's some two-thirds of the way out. So again, nothing special. Uh, after that, Edwin Hubble and uh, others have shown that, uh, you know, there are many galaxies, you know, by the latest estimate, maybe as two trillion galaxies in the observable universe alone. Um, the Kepler Observatory has shown that there are terrestrial planets, planets a bit like the Earth in our own galaxy, in numbers like from a few hundred billion, uh, from a few hundred million to, to a billion or so. So in that respect, also we're nothing special. And finally, perhaps, uh, there are some speculative theories now, you know, which is called the multiverse, which maybe even our entire universe is just one member of a huge ensemble of universes and so on. So in all of these steps, we have kind of progressed to a situation where the theory is not dependent on us being there or or the earth being in a special location so and we would like most theories to do that i would should mention something though the last step which i mentioned multiverse that maybe there are many universes uh that's maybe where Copernican humility meets it, its limit. Because it is possible that in these many universes, the laws of physics are different or the values of constant of nature are different so that, for example, complexity and life could not emerge in them. So our universe is somewhat, if this ensemble exists, our universe may be special in this ensemble, uh, not, you know, quite the same as everything else. Um, so <laughs> to, to give you an, uh, a, a somewhat silly example, but which exemplifies this is, suppose you wake up in the morning and you wonder, what am I? Now, if you just went by statistics and by uh, you know, not wanting to be special at all, you would say, I'm an insect. Because insects are the largest biomass on Earth. At any given moment, the estimate is that there are about 10 to the 19 insects. On Earth. It's one followed by 19 zeros of insects. So, you know, just speaking like that, chances are you are an, in an insect, yes? But why is it not true? Why is it false? And you are not an insect. Because merely by wondering about the question, what am I? You already distinguished yourself as being special and not an insect. Yes. So, yes, you want this general like Copernican principle to be nothing special, but it does hit a limit at the end. Uh, so, you know, we now hit that limit, for example, in this example. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's really fascinating. You, you also dismiss, I suppose, uh, the value of, of elegance, which is another sort of criterion that a lot of scientists bring up as, as uh, not being particularly necessary for a definition of beauty in scientific theories, right? No, I, I don't dismiss it. I, I mean, I, you know, elegance, uh, is brought a lot in mathematics. I mean, people talk about elegant proofs. There are proofs that are um, shorter, usually, uh, simpler, uh, somewhat surprising, and, and so on. Now, in physics, I think that this concept of elegance is captured by a combination of simplicity and symmetry. 
Uh, so this is why I, I didn't bother to list it separately. But elegance is certainly something very nice to have. And uh, in, in mathematics, it's, it, it's, you know, there definitely are problems where, you know, uh, the proof is more elegant this way than it is that way. Uh, you find the answer in more elegant ways and so on. So it's an important concept, but I want it to be as as reductionist as possible in my definition. So I I, I did not list it as a separate right, right, uh, right, necessary right. condition. Yeah, you see it as a function of, of other, yeah, of symmetry and simplicity. Um, tell us about your own experience, you know, in your own career. Are there moments of encounters with beauty that stand out to you in your memory? Well, you, not necessarily things that I have done. I mean, there are things uh, that clearly stand out to me uh, as... I, I just mentioned this element of surprise. Uh, 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 the, the element of surprise is um is very important uh and it, well it's captured in these other things but but yes but it, it is important by that i mean for example if i look at general relativity which is this incredible theory of einstein that describes gravity you know for the life of me i still did not understand how he thought about that uh, i mean there are many things that are in the air and, you know, for example, special relativity, had Einstein not written it, somebody else would have within a year or two. Uh, Henri Poincaré was extremely close, uh, you know, to, to, to writing something like this. Uh, general relativity, yes, uh, you know, Hilbert was, was playing with some ideas like that and so on, but not so much, more on the, in the mathematical sense and somewhat less than, you know, Einstein's really concept of everything that there is. It wasn't in the air. Uh, similarly, I, I've written a book about symmetry, which was called The Equation That Couldn't Be Solved. And in it, I described this French mathematician, Evariste Galois, who died at the age of 20. But before the age of 20, he invented a branch of mathematics that today we call group theory. Um, that was not in the air at all when he formulated it. I mean, that, you know, really blows my mind when I see uh, things, things like that. Um, so uh, those are the types of things that, that really, you know, that when sometimes catches you by by surprise like that. I mean, those those are moments that I, I definitely remember. Yeah. They seem to evoke a sense of awe, I suppose, right? I mean, the fact that someone can come up with something that's like right. this. That's, that's right. Yeah. But in this case, I mean, there is awe from the universe itself, yes, which is so fantastically beautiful in itself. Yes, we all feel that. Yeah, you, you, you have to look at, you know, the new images of, that came from the James Webb Space Telescope or previous images that came from the Hubble telescope and, and so on. And you, you just realize that not only are they almost as attractive to the eye as works of art, but at the same time, they actually represent real objects in our universe, which you know adds to it yet another dimension. So there is that awe, and then there is the awe that what the human mind is capable of, you know, how could this young mathematician of age, by the age of 20, do that? You know, I'm trying to think, you know, I, I've had a fairly reasonable career as, as a scientist, but when I'm trying to think, what have I done by age 20? <laughs> the answer is absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy formulated group theory, you know, I mean, wow. it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's astonishing. Um, I mean, there's also, I suppose, that, uh, you know, that famous Einstein quotation that, you know, that the, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but, you know, what is what is marvelous about the universe, the fact that we're able to understand it at all, right? I mean, the very fact that if you add that to your Copernican principle, given how insignificant we are in the scheme of things, it seems rather bizarre that we're capable of grasping 
the laws that govern everything. Uh, and, right. Uh, or that. Yeah. From a physical perspective, from a physical perspective, we are insignificant. But but from the sense of what Einstein meant when he said that, uh, we are extremely significant because you see, with every step that I mentioned, for example, in, in, with these five Copernican revolutions, if you like, those revolutions meant that we as humans understood something new that we didn't know before. So our mind expanded precisely as fast as our physical significance diminished. So in, in that sense, we really are central to everything. That's extraordinary. Yeah. Um, I suppose, I mean, yeah, I wonder what you think about whether... Um, what scientists have found beautiful um, over the centuries has changed in that respect, right? So I, I suppose prior to Copernicus, maybe what might have been beautiful would have been things that established our centrality in the scheme of things, uh, as opposed to now things that establish how decentered we are. I, I, do, do, do you see any changes, I, I suppose, over over the centuries in these sort of fundamental aesthetic criteria that govern science? No, I think it is more a matter of perspective. You see, for many, many centuries, uh, people thought that the, the orbits of planets around the sun have to be circles, mainly because of aesthetic reasons. Uh, uh, when Kepler discovered that the orbits are ellipses, Galileo, the great Galileo, did not accept that because he was still also prisoner to this aesthetic idea that the orbits have to be uh, cir circles. But you see, that came from a misunderstanding because the symmetry is not of the shapes. The symmetry is of the laws. The law of gravity is symmetric under rotations, which means... Yes, the orbit is an ellipse, but the ellipse can have any orientation in space, and all of those are allowed. Had Galileo been taught that, I'm sure that he would have found that these ellipses are also beautiful. Uh, it, it was just a misunderstanding because at that time they still didn't have, you know, the right perspective. Yeah, on yeah. Beauty at Work is brought to you by Templeton Religion Trust. If you enjoyed this clip, go check out the full episode. And please take a moment to subscribe and leave us a review. It really helps get the word out about the show. Thanks and see you next time.